Whoop. Potatoes with cheese sauce. I'm going to demonstrate for you. Um, it's a two day assignment. The first day we're just going to prep our potatoes. So, we're going to prep it tomorrow, yes. Grab a potato. Now, where do potatoes grow? Underground. Underground. So, you might want to wash it and get some of that dirt off. And then we're going to dry it as well. Doesn't take a lot, a lot of time, a lot of effort, but everyone's going to wash their own potato. Everyone's going to dry their own potato. And we're going to coat them in oil. So you'll have some oil that your forager gets, rub them all around in oil. And then you'll have some salt, some kosher salt. Kosher salt is a bigger grain of salt, almost like rock salt, but not quite as big. And then you're going to rub your potato in the salt, getting it all nice and coated with salt. Well, I know what you're thinking. That seems like a lot of salt, but let me explain what happens. Um, first of all, most people don't eat the peeling. And so that salt, you'll never know that salt's there. Secondly, if you do eat the peeling, all you have to do is after you bake it, just give it a quick brush and the salt will come right off. So um, I'm not a big salt lover myself. So no, you, I wouldn't expect you to eat all that salt, but it helps the potato uh, dry out, or it draws the steam out of it so there's not too watery. Uh, and some of the salt does soak in, but not a lot of it. But like I said, just brush it off if you eat the peeling. Um, or even if you put it in your bowl and you don't want that salt to get in it, just brush it off real quick after you bake it. But it needs to be there while you bake it. So on tomorrow when you get here, you're going to take your potatoes and everyone's going to do this. Please prepare a potato for someone who's not here. So if someone's absent, but part of your team, get a potato ready for them. Then you're going to put it in a bag and make sure the bag is labeled correctly with your period in your kitchen. Those potatoes in the bag are going to go underneath your kitchen table on the shelf there and wait for Friday. Friday when you come in here, your potatoes will be in the oven already baked. You take them out of the oven, you get the bag that says period five, and you put those in the oven. So that when period five comes to class, guess what? There's a ready to go. There's a ready to go. Because it takes a minimum of an hour. So there's no way we could do this all at once. So we're helping each other out. So since yours will be in the oven, you're going to put someone else's in the oven when you take yours out. Um, yours will be here. You guys will be here after lunch. So they should be ready as soon as you get here. But if they're not ready as soon as you get here, maybe you got an extra big potato. <coughs> Then you can leave them in a few more minutes. That's fine. How do you know if a potato is cooked? Take a towel or a pot holder. Squeeze it. If it's hard as a rock, it ain't done. If it's soft, like a ripe avocado, it's done. Then you're going to make your cheese sauce. Now a cheese sauce is... <clears throat> We start with uh, milk and a thickening agent. Uh, once we thicken our milk, we have something called a bechamel, which is called a basic white sauce or a mother sauce or a bechamel. And basically all that is is a thickened milk sauce. It doesn't have much flavor, but it can be the beginnings of lots of other sauces or gravies. Uh, if you ever made or have had country gravy, it's basically a bechamel with bacon and sausage and salt and pepper and some other seasonings uh, that you put over your biscuits and eggs, etc. cetera. Um, we're not gonna do, flavor it with bacon and eggs, but we're gonna flavor it with cheese. So we start by making a bechamel. And we start the bechamel by making a roux. Now on your recipe, there's a word R-O-U-X, it's pronounced roux, the X is silent. It's a French word and it's a thickening agent. Now, the last few weeks, we've been talking about leavening agents. And what do leavening agents do? Make your baked products do what? 
rise. Well, this is not a leavening agent. This is a thickening agent. So it makes your sauces and gravies what? Thicker. Right. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, the recipe for a roux is always the same. Equal parts fat and flour. You can use olive oil. You can use vegetable oil. You can use bacon grease. You can use butter. You can use margarine. You can use chicken fat. You can be use beef fat. Any kind of fat you want, equal parts, fat and flour. We're going to use margarine. I'll get that right here. Okay, both margarine and butter come in sticks like this. And on the stick, I don't know if you can see that at all. There's little lines. There's a line to represent each tablespoon. So almost every time that we use butter and margarine and it needs to be measured, I'll measure it for you. Uh, let me get one that's already opened. So your recipe says two tablespoons of butter or margarine. I'm going to measure out two tablespoons and cut it. There will be six chunks of margarine here on the demo table. You grab one because it's already measured. Don't grab two thinking two tablespoons. I'm going to grab two. No, I'm already measuring it into two tablespoon chunks. For today's demonstration, I'm going to cut the recipe in half. So for my purposes, today, I'm only going to cut one tablespoon. But you will have a two tablespoon chunk here. Just grab one of them. So there's my one tablespoon of margarine. And a roux is always equal parts fat and flour. If you just throw flour in your milk, the flour turns to lumps. So you don't want that. So there's my one tablespoon of each. You, of course, will be using two tablespoons of each. Uh, can I use can I use a rubber spatula in these in our cookware? Is it heat protected? Yes, we can. Our pans are non-stick surface, but all of our rubber spatulas in this classroom are heat resistant. So I'm going to let that heat up and melt, and then it'll mix together. While I'm doing that, um, let's measure out some milk. Somebody put away my measuring cup. I'm headed over there. <laughs> You're doing fine. You'll be using one cup of milk. I'm using half a cup of milk. Uh, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the date on milk. This says best by 4th of October 2019. Does that mean on the 5th it's bad? Yes. No, it doesn't mean that at all. That's kind of weird. That date is for the supermarkets. They cannot sell it after that date. But how long milk lasts depends on how cold it's been kept. So if you look, I have a thermometer in a box in the window by my desk, and it shows you how many days milk will last according or depending on how cold it's been kept and if you freeze it it'll keep for weeks even months and i've done that too like if we have leftover milk in december since we'll be out for two weeks i usually freeze it <coughs> so the colder you keep it the longer it'll last the nice thing about milk is you can tell if it's gone bad by how it smells and how it tastes. Not all foods can you do that. A lot of people get food poisoning from seafood that's gone bad, but they don't know it's bad until they're puking their guts out. Um, because you can't always taste it. With milk, you know. If it smells bad, tastes bad, throw it out. But if it smells bad, it smells okay and tastes okay, it's fine even though it's past the sell-by date. Obviously, if you keep it at 33 degrees, it'll last longer. 40 degrees won't last as long. If you go down below 32 degrees, it will freeze. That's okay too, unless you need it right away. 
So you're going to use a cup of milk. I'm using a half a cup of milk. And I'm going to mix my flour and my fat together and make kind of a paste. But then I have to cook it for a little bit. Otherwise, it tastes like paste. So get all that flour absorbed by the fat or margarine in this case. And once it starts to sizzle, I'm going to let it sizzle for about a minute. Okay, so it's starting to sizzle now, so we're going to let that cook for about a minute. Somebody tell me when a minute's gone past without using your phone. Someone who has a watch or can see the clock on the wall. Like that? Yep, like that. While that's happening, I'm going to measure out the cheese. You guys will be using two cups of cheese. I'm using one cup. Now the expert gravy makers, professional chefs, tell me, or at least I've read, when making a sauce or gravy, you should have cold liquid and a warm roux, or vice versa. But if they're both, this, they're both hot or they're both cold, it doesn't work so good. Um, so we're gonna have a hot roux and cold milk. So now, that's what it looks like. Yep, but you're not gonna eat that. That's just the thickening agent for this. Now, as soon as that cold milk hits the roux, it's gonna make it hard again because it's got a lot of margarine. It's like putting that margarine in the refrigerator again, even though it was all heated up. So now, as the milk comes up to temperature, once it comes up to temperature, I should say, it will melt the roux, but thickening won't take place until the whole thing comes to a boil. When I make gravy at home or sauces at home, I don't have a recipe every time. So I'll have a separate pot or pan with my roux in it, and then I can add my roux as needed. But I have to remember the sauce needs to come to a boil before the roux does its work. Otherwise I'm adding roux, adding roux, adding roux, adding roux, and finally it comes to a boil and it's too thick because I put in too much roux. So just remember it has to come to a boil before the thickening takes place. I like to use a whisk, helps break up the lumps. The last thing we want, well, there's two bad things about making a sauce like this. One, we don't want it to burn. Two, we don't want lumps. And even I get lumps sometimes. So now I've melted all the, the roux because the milk's coming up to temperature. Yours will take a little bit longer to heat up because you have twice as much milk. Um, so it's all melted now, but it's still thin because it hasn't come to a boil yet. So I'm going to continue to stir so it doesn't burn. And once it comes to a boil, it'll start to thicken. The more I cook it, the thicker it'll get to a point. So now it just looks like milk. And again, this is a bechamel, basic white sauce. 
And if I flavored it with bacon and sausage and salt and pepper, it would be country gravy. But I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna put cheese in it, make a cheese sauce. Some cooks like to put this in their lasagna to keep the whole thing from drying out. It's just a plain bechamel. So it's the beginnings of lots of sauces and gravies. Starting to thicken up a little bit there. Remember, uh, you want it to be a little bit thin still because once you add the cheese, it's gonna get twice as thick, just like that. So there we are, we've thickened it up. Turn off the heat, right Rose? Mm -hmm. And then put the cheese in. Uh, we don't wanna cook it too much once the cheese is in because cheese is kind of a delicate substance. What's the main ingredient, or excuse me, what's the main nutrient in cheese? Uh, nutrient, there's only six to choose from. Vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates, protein, fiber. Even more so than protein, it's fat. Cheeses can be 50% fat. And that fat can separate out from the rest of the cheese. Do you ever get a pizza and there was like this layer of grease floating on top of the pizza? That's because the high temperatures in the pizza oven have separated the cheese fat, the milk fat out of the cheese and caused it to separate. So. You don't want to heat it up too much, and so I always turn off the heat when I put the cheese in. A Little bit of seasoning, little is better than too much, because you can always add salt and pepper at the table, but you can never take it away. I'm using a little bit of Lowry seasoning there. You can add a little heat if it gets too thick, but don't overheat it. It's good. 